Uh, we're going to begin with a little bit of missions sharing. So if you could just look up at the screen, and uh, my wife's going to share a few things, and then I'm going to share a few things. Can you all look up there? Yeah. Good. If I can just get control, that'd be wonderful. Now I'm out of control. <laughs> I am not controlling. I am controlling. That's my problem. Um, probably have to go to a, a manual, okay? Next slide, please. Next one. Okay. I love... Go on. I love it when I can travel around the world but bring my wife with me. Next. I do a much better job. Yes, we've come back from Africa. Next. You recently heard sharing from Mark Ottenweller. He and his wife Lynn were in South Africa and Mozambique. So let's call it Southeast Africa. Next. I and my wife were in Southwest Africa. Next. Okay, so I was this side, he is that side. Next. Okay. Places like Angola, next, where they speak Portuguese and things. Namibia, where Vicky and I had an absolute blast and saw lots of, next, wild animals. Keep going. If you went to my Facebook, you watched this guy charge me, but he didn't get me. Okay, so we were in uh, Pretoria, Johannesburg, we were in Durban on the Indian Ocean, incredible sharing. Next. Oh, back. 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 Okay, that's why I said to the lion. Vicky's going to share a bit about Africa. I'm going to talk about the Caribbean. Please give her um, your attention. Good morning. Thank you so much for your support of the teaching ministry that allows Doug and even this time for me to go to South Africa or Southern Africa. I've often told Doug that he lives the life of the Apostle Paul, a modern day version of the Apostle Paul. But I felt like I got to be a Timothy this time. And in 1 Thessalonians, it talks about being a co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage saints in their faith. And this is a huge part of what the teaching ministry does, is we're able to go to other places, other disciples, other fellowships around the world and encourage them and offer them strength from God's word. And a huge part of that is because of the tremendous support that we have here at North River, and I really thank you for that. Some of you support by collecting old suitcases, and on this trip we went with your old suitcases filled with 300 pounds of books, teaching supplies, um, spiritual books that some of you have donated, materials, and we went off on a 16-hour flight. There's a direct flight from here to Johannesburg. That's a long, long way. After eight hours, you feel like you're ready to get off the plane, and you're only halfway there. Um, but it, it was a fantastic trip, and I really thank you for the support that you give us. Um, for me, we, I spent a week in Pretoria. Pretoria is the capital, a little bit like DC is for the United States, Pretoria is for South Africa. It's where the government is, it's where the, all the embassies are. And we were able to stay with the Setswe family. Uh, most of us know that Africa has had huge racial tensions in South Africa. And this was a black family, and it meant so much to the disciples there that we were able to stay with them and he's a foremost AIDS researcher and works for pub has a PhD in public health. And he's funded by the CDC to do work on research and AIDS. And he's also a professor at one of the universities there. And one of the things we stayed with Magrin and Jeff and their two girls that struck me is that they're very educated, but all their education is to be in the service of other people. And it struck me how much they appreciated their education but it challenged me about my education, because often in the United States, education is for bettering ourselves. But here I learned and saw how people have received education, but it's to better the community. It's in service to others, it's to bring glory to God. Amen. I was able to share at a number of women's midweeks and women's nights, and the main thing I asked and taught about was whether we have a glorious life or a life that brings glory to God. Uh, I was able to meet up with some of the campus women and Bethany and Jake Ostrowski are over there and we were able to connect with them and share with them to have tea in the park. And really in South Africa I felt so at home because there they drink hot tea with milk and no explanation is required. <laughs> if you haven't gathered, I'm from English and there's a big Brit that's still part of me. 
Our main purpose for going was actually to be a part of the South African School of Missions that was teaching a series similar to the AIM program that Doug runs here in the United States on Christ and culture. And I had an opportunity to teach and to share just about how our different cultures, I'm from England, but whether you're from the United States, the culture of the United States or the culture of South Africa, it puts a lens on all of us and it affects how we read the gospel. And we think that our way is right and so often it's from our traditions and being able to get away from that and really be able to share, understand what our traditions are, how it can cloud our perspective or our vision or our understanding of what the Bible is actually saying. What I loved about this group in Johannesburg, it was all many of the staff, the full-time staff, whether junior, interns, senior, everyone, men and women, all came together to learn. Everyone was divided into small groups, discussion groups, to talk about what they were learning. And it really was a tremendous time of unity and faith building, but really a time to dig into the scriptures. I was also blessed, to, and Doug and I, we both went to the Apartheid Museum. <coughs> Because although we go to hopefully encourage and strengthen others, it's an opportunity for us to learn. And to see what South Africa has done, the unity that exists in the country, um, what has happened and transpired in the last 20 years since they voted in a democracy has been very, is very impressive. But perhaps what's more impressive is the lives of the people and of the disciples who've really been through severe struggle. They've, been, they've despaired at life even at times. There's been a tremendous amount of violence. There's a horrendous amount of, uh, what can, uh, of just violence and violence against, against women as well. Um, and yet what I see in the women there and was able to share with a group called the Cedars, who are women who are empty nesters and some of the grannies that Lynn shared about last week, is that there's a tremendous spirit of patience and love and that God is leading their lives. They're not looking to the government to sort out their problems, but they're trusting in God. And their fight is to persevere and it's to be righteous, but they're not fighting for their rights. And if ever I've come across of a group of people who've been disenfranchised, who have have been treated incredibly unjustly, unfairly, unrighteously in life, it would be some of these women in South Africa from Soweto. And there was a group of 30 women probably in their 60s and 70s that came up from Soweto. And to hear them sing their praises to God in the Zulu language was so moving and so inspiring. And it challenged me about, do I have that kind of patience? Am I fighting to be righteous or am I fighting for my own rights? Am I, am I looking for a glorious, comfortable life or really a life that glorifies God? And when I looked at these women, their lives glorified God. It was very moving. I grew up in England, as I said, in a country that really is disinterested in Christianity. And most of my understanding as a young child or as a young teen came from singing hymns uh, during our school assemblies that we had every day. But interestingly, I was christened because that's a tradition where I grew up. And I have a traditional godmother whose name is Dora Brown. She now lives in South Africa. And one of the most encouraging things for me uh, when we got there, the church said, is there anything we can do for you? And I said, yes, I really would like to visit my godmother. She's 85 years old. And we were able to work it out and Doug and I were able to go. And she's in an assisted living. We had no idea, it's been hard to be in touch with just her moving. Um, but I got to see her. And she was going, three days later, she was about to have heart surgery. She'd been very ill. And it was so incredible to me because this is the one woman I believe probably had prayed for me, had some spiritual influence many, many years. I've only met her one other time 26 years ago in England. And I have today a Bible that she gave me when I was christened. I think now in America, this is from 1962. Uh, this would be an antique because it's 50 years old, so that also makes me an antique at the same time. <laughs> but to be able to be there, to thank her for the encouragement, for giving me this Bible. I've moved many times, but for some reason, I still have this, have God's word. And it was so inspiring to be with her. We met her son, we met one of her daughters-in-law, we popped in. They were so, they're a spiritual family. They were so interested in what we were doing. 
Doug gave her a copy of his new book and we've already heard back that she's read it. Her surgery went well, but it was so amazing to see that that was a personal encouragement for me and how encouraging to go and find, in a sense, a relative, someone who's had a spiritual connection to you for years and be able to encourage her at a time of need in her life. We then went off to Durban to do a staff training and that was on the Indian Ocean, it was beautiful. And I was able to teach the staff women uh, on lessons I've learned on parenting. I entitled the lesson, and many parents will sympathize with this, I call, called the good, the bad, and the ugly of parenting. Um, but it was an encouraging time, a strengthening time for the mothers. Then we went to Namibia, which you saw was on the uh, west side, um, and we went to Windhoek. And it's amazing, because this is a congregation, I think, of 70 so disciples. There's no full-time staff there. But there's a couple in their 60s who are from the United States called Scott and Pam McQuidy. I think McQuide? McQuide? I got the name wrong, sorry, McQuide. It's so impressive. He's an architect and she works in public health. And they're out there uh, because she's helping with the infrastructure, with the public health system, and as a researcher with AIDS as well. And they've gone out there, they've been in Kenya before, but they are such a stabilizing force for this congregation. They're able to have a home, they're able to provide. He's working on a plan, of designing a plan for a building they're about to lease so that they can have a permanent church building. And we were able to donate lots of books because they're going to have a church library. And I thank you for many of you who give us old books to take. Um, and some of those went and some of the teaching materials as well going to the library. But it was so encouraging to see people my age or a little bit older. And I think sometimes we wonder, once our children have gone, or once we get to that retirement age, what can I do? But to see people like the McKees there giving and encouraging the saints was so very inspiring. So I just really do say thank you so much for letting me go to be Timothy to ride on Doug's coattails as he gets to go around the world. But it was a wonderful time to be able to share and encourage the women, but also to be encouraged and strengthened and challenged myself to be like the women in Soweto and have that spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. I think that's an excellent question. You may be in your 20s. What are you going to be doing when you're in your 60s? Are, are you thinking about uh, living in the lap of luxury, enjoying your retirement, your golden years? Or maybe it's time to give thought to the rest of the world. Let's see if I have power. I'm going to share a little bit more. Or am I just as powerful as I was before? I am fully dependent, like a little baby. Next, please. Okay. <laughs> I've been in a, a lot of places since last time. Last time I preached in this room was a few weeks ago where I shared all about the Middle East, but this is Africa and the Caribbean, where I've just got back from a couple of days ago. Africa, I was teaching with my colleague Dave Pakta in the biblical training school. We're starting a similar program in the Caribbean. And last week we met in Jamaica, it's called the Damien Jean-Baptiste Caribbean School of Ministry. Damien was a huge advocate for training. He was one of our AIM graduates, and uh, some of the other graduates are putting this together, and there are three of us, and we teach in the Western Caribbean, based in Jamaica. Oh, next, please. And there's the, uh, our friends in Kingston, next. I went with a friend, actually, from Atlanta. Keep going. So it's divided west and east, uh, there they are. That's, that's the Jamaican. That's the Trinidadian. They may look the same, but they sound very different. And the three of us taught together. This makes it more fun to teach with friends. Keep going. And this, the audience, they're only expecting 100. It was closer to 150. So we had our credit students, and just like Africa, everyone was there. And it wasn't just all the staff, senior, junior. It was all the mature Christians in the church. There was no one who said, I don't really need this. I've been through it. I've been trained. Everyone was there. This was really encouraging. Almost half the membership took off Friday, Saturday, Sunday to learn. I'll go back. Yeah, there they are. Okay, keep going. Eager to learn and next. Happy about it with a great attitude and just one last picture there. I'll, I'll go back of Courtney and Tyrone. So in, on Thursday this week, I'm going back to the Caribbean. I'll be on the east side. I'll be with 
uh, those same guys will be teaching the same classes, and if you want to come down to Trinidad, who apparently still have extremely fond memories next of North River, then you're very welcome to come right there. That's the other part. And right before I came back, I had two uh, days to visit the church in next, a place called the Bahamas next. It's not very nice. You wouldn't really want to go there next. <laughs> but. We have to teach everywhere, and I appreciate your prayers for me as I go to Trinidad on Thursday and also the South American nation of Suriname. Next. That's the sharing. Hope is meaningful. Next. Psalm 40, please open your Bible. In my remaining time, I want to share a kind of a devotional message. I want to speak on a fundamental biblical principle, and it's one that you would find in every book of the Bible. In other words, this theme I could justify from any book. We could do it from Numbers or Deuteronomy. We could do it from Joshua, Judges, or Ruth. Happens to be, I'm going to do it from Psalms. Why not? It applies to all God's people. And yet, even if you are not considering yourself a serious student of the Word of God, yet, I think this will apply to you too. Because it's not just a spiritual biblical principle. It's a human principle. And if we're humans, we'll get it. It's a big deal. I'm going to support this from the Psalms. I think we will be familiar with Psalm 51:10, where he prays, create in me a pure heart. This, this longing for a pure heart. Don't we want that? And then a little later on, and he says, and sinners will turn back to you. Why? Because I'm going to teach them your ways. It's that connection between being renewed, energized ourselves, and impact on other people. And this theme is everywhere. It's an interchange with an outward consequence. Telling other people is normal. Where did the Israelites come from? I know God gives them the Ten Commandments. Okay, so they came from Sinai. But where were they before Sinai? Right, they were in slavery in Egypt. Then Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and then uh, the laws are explained. And section one, this is in Exodus 21, that very first section is on how you treat those who work for you. It's laws on servants or slaves because we need to treat people with dignity and fairness and as human beings. And this explains why there's so much in the Old Testament about caring not just for servants, but for all the oppressed, the marginalized, and that holy trio, orphans, widows, and aliens. This is huge in the Old Testament. Well, why does the Old Testament emphasize caring for others so much? Because the Jews themselves knew what it was like to be oppressed, to have to work a seven-day week, and then got commuted to just a six-day week. But they knew what it was like to be, part, to be cogs in a system that was dehumanizing, that was all about production, 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 and they need to care for others. Now, all right, here's our text in Psalm 40. Now, Psalm 40, we read about, and you have to turn there because I'm not going to project it. Don't be lazy. We, we can actually kill that, you know, because otherwise we, we don't need it. Um, in this particular psalm, the fellow is overwhelmed. He, he describes himself as being in a pit. And the pit is largely because of his own stupidity, his own errors. But others are taking advantage of him at that point. And all we're going to do is look at the early verses, but I think it illustrates this theme so well. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Perhaps the translation you're looking at reads differently. I'm confident, however, that the thought is the same. In the New King James Version, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me. You know, he's listening. He heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit. Have you ever been in a pit? This guy was. I thought of my own situation. I've been in a pit. I've been in quicksand. 
I've been in riptide, where I thought I'd drown. I've been in financial pits a couple times, where no light of day was penetrating. I've been in the pit of sin and needed to be restored, Galatians 6 style, by a brother or a group of brothers who cared. But think how many are in a pit. It may be uh, medical. Think of the Ebola epidemic on our planet. Think of those sorry souls without hope in places like Gaza right now, or places of confusion like the Ukraine, the Eastern Ukraine, or maybe Western Russia. Think of spiritual rescue. It's not just physical rescue, it's spiritual rescue. Now, go on, what's your next verse say? Please look down at verse three. See, he brought me up out of the pit, and then we read, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Can you see the connection there? He's lifted up out of the pit, and next thing, he wants to express his gratitude. He wants others to know. And you will find this theme smeared all over the Psalms, in fact, all over the entire Bible, where those who are rescued end up with a message in their mouth, and they end up becoming rescuers. This is a simple idea, a fundamental idea, because God's people, if you are God's people, we know what it's like to be rescued. You'd say, well, what is this, Douglas? Is this a sermon on evangelism? No. What I'm talking about today is much bigger than evangelism. If you're talking about rescuing the planet and all the billions of people on it, it's not that it's not evangelism, and maybe I'm being sneaky here, but I actually think it's a lot bigger than just sharing the gospel message. This has to do with how we interact with other people. It has to do with what we're living for, what we're dying for, what we believe life is about. It's not just some activity. I did a lesson a couple years ago that they wanted me to teach on evangelism in the early church. This was in Finland. And I said, uh, evangelism in the early church, that's kind of broad. Can we narrow it down a bit? And they said, well, what do you think? I said, well, why don't we just do it from the year 30 up to the year 200? Even then, I'm... Oh, <laughs> I'm swimming in information. I mean, there's so much evidence in history, but also in the Bible, about how they did it. And so we did that. We squeezed it into just two hours. Now, in that study, we made two observations. In the early church, the evangelism, firstly, was chaotic. There wasn't much of a plan, like, okay, the council met, and we had a strategy, and we divided things up this way. We had 12 lines that way for the 12 apostles, and 10 ways this way, uh, for the 10 uh, holy seasons, and then we, uh, ally uh, no, it was nothing like that. It's organic, it's chaotic, it's like five guys are praying one day in Acts 13, they say, hmm, we don't all need to be here. How about two of us go somewhere? Let's go to Cyprus and we'll see what happens. And that's the first missionary journey. Or look at the chaotic kind of evangelism in Acts 6, Acts 7, Acts 8. And so you'll see that in the scripture, you'll see it in the early church, things just happen. I know we would like to think that the apostles, and Jesus for that matter, was a strategist who lined everything up, and it was all prepared with the tools for planting and analysis. It wasn't like that. It just happened. Just like today, it just happened. People talking to other people, and then people say, why don't we get a group in our house? It's very organic, very grassroots. But the other thing you see in the early church is the energy, the passion, the spirit. Yeah, it may be chaotic, but it's not just chaotic, it is courageous. Uh, these people really believe in what they are doing, and that's the beautiful combination. On fire, maybe a little uh, messy, but it's on fire, how about you? You say, well, um, I don't really have the strategy, so I can't really be on fire yet. I'm still determining the best approach. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. You can work on your approach, but you should really just jump in. Uh, I'm waiting to be licensed. See, I need to have permission to preach. Look, guys, this is not the 18th century where you need a license from the state in order to preach. Anyone can preach. No one's holding you back. No one's saying, well, you can't go out there and just talk to people, friends and neighbors. No one's holding you back. You don't need permission to do that. You have permission in the Bible. 
You've got permission in Psalm 40. You've got permission everywhere. How are we doing with that? And I love the way this psalm continues, even though our text is over. He, he, he carries on. It, it's actually kind of it's a strange passage. And I, you've seen this in the New Testament. Because it says, a body you've prepared for me, verse 6. Or in the Hebrew, it may say, you've, you've uh, pierced my ears. See that in verse 6? What? And then in verse 8, I desire to do your will. In fact, he says, your law is within my heart. Okay, what does that have to do with putting, sticking something in his ear? In the Old Testament, if you loved your master, you had your ear pierced. And you had a special marking that showed your lifelong love attachment to that family. Or it could be simply, if you love God, God opens your ears, meaning that we're receptive to his commandments. Either way, the result is, verse 8, that there's a desire to do great things for God. It's a desire because the law is in our heart. It's not just something we have to do. It's something that, that we want to do. It's natural. It's organic. It just overflows. Telling others is natural. When I turn 90, I'm going to tell people. We're going to celebrate. That's a natural thing. Uh, when uh, we have good news, we share. When we're aware, we share. When we leave the mire, we're filled with desire. When you get out of the pit, uh, what happens? I mean, you can't just sit. So let's go on. <laughs> men, I'd say men especially. This is important for everyone in the room, but men especially, because we men, if we don't have something we're taken out of that pit, and if we don't have something we throw ourselves into, we find something. We throw ourselves into work. We want to improve. And maybe, maybe it's making money. Maybe it's simply something else that you compete in. Maybe you don't care about money, but you really care about sports. But whatever it is, we need to throw ourselves into God, or as males, we'll find something else, and we'll drift, and we end up in some strange places like I did when I was in Africa, not paying terribly much attention at the airport until I left the, what I thought was the men's room and I was just walking out and I horrified a woman walking in. <gasps> I said, no, it's not you, it's me. I just had wandered in. This is not the first time I've done that. <laughs> I've done it on the telephone. I've done, I can done it maybe three or four times, which knowing me is actually pretty good, only that many times. But when you're not focused in the right way, you can end up in some interesting places. I'm glad they didn't call security. All right, now, <laughs> men tend to do that. You'd say, but how can I share? All right, I get it. He takes me out. He gives me, I, I've got a song. I'm positive. I'm happy. But how do I find time? I'm a busy man. Well, daily life situations. I was thinking about when I flew to Houston for the, I went to a whole conference on hell two Sundays ago. I, I preached in Houston. A whole conference was on hell and whether the soul is immortal. It was brilliant. So it was kind of natural. The guy I'm flying with asked me, and so what are you doing in Houston? <laughs> I'm going to a conference on hell. <laughs> so it's just a natural kind of thing. Just like you, you can try that. Actually, I did, and it was great. It was a good talk. But then I was flying to Jamaica, where I preached last week in, in Jamaica. The woman sitting in front of me, five minutes in, she turns around and says, I know you. I know you. I visited your church. We met in the book area out there. I said, remind me, because I'm a little fuzzy. And she reminds me. I said, oh, yeah, I remember where it was. Yeah, I remember now, which I did. I wasn't just being polite. You meet some great people on planes. Well, I don't fly much. Okay, well then you're taking the bus. You meet people. Um, reach out to people in a store. I reached out to a fellow in a store seven years ago. We exchanged emails. Seven days ago, he was looking for me. And he was having trouble. And I just happened to walk into his store. So this weekend we spent two hours Together, talking about his life and his faith. You know, you plant the seed seven years ago, and now the guy's looking, you know, because often the seeds take seven or 14 years, nine, or it's kind of like the cicada. It's on some kind of a cycle. And we are so impatient. So many people need 10 or 20 years for that seed to germinate. Don't give up. Just do all the good you can. Just natural situations. The place where my mom lives um, in Roswell, about eight of the staff are reading my new book down there which is really fun, so I give that out. Or maybe you're, we're having dinner with neighbors tonight, 
These are not contrived situations. These are just things you do as a human being and then having some good news you want to share. I thought one other example, because you may say you're kind of introverted. If you may recall, I was talking about Skype uh, when, I, when I preached here in June, that even an introverted person could reach out to someone by Skype. And I was talking about this excited Arab woman who studied the scriptures with one of the sisters who lived four hours away from her, every single study done by Skype. Not only is the sister completely on fire, but you should have met this young woman whom I met in Abu Dhabi, all done by Skype. But there you are. If you're a shy person, a retiring person, fine. Retire behind your computer and do some good. Since you're online, do some good. Oh, but what would they think of me? I mean, people don't, people don't care. This, this is just, this, this is cyber world. And yeah, there are dangers, and don't be stupid, and don't be victimized, but use the technology in a good way. There you go. So, do you have the idea now, it's my simple thought, that the rescued become rescuers. It's what authentic Christians do. So let's look one last time at our passage before I sit down and you stand up. Okay. <laughs> he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of mud and mire. Okay, this is our sin. We're in the mud. I once stepped out of the canoe. I got out of the canoe and I was in mud up to my waist, over three feet of mud. <laughs> mud and mire. He lifts us out. You never get yourself out. Set my feet on a rock. Gave me a firm place to stand. Think of Stone Mountain. It's firm. It's not going anywhere. Nowhere soon. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And when we've got that energy and you're positive like that, that attracts people. If you're just sour, you're not going to attract, you know, the vinegar is not that good a strategy. Honey's pretty good, though. And there you are. People are attracted to positive people. And then many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. And that's how the message spreads globally. And it's not so much through strategic planning. It's just through appreciating. He take, took us out of the pit. He gives us something to do. So, don't wait to be told to respond. You don't need permission. It's an honor to share. It's a passion. It's an honor. It's our joy. And when we do, then we are reminded that we are part of an international fellowship worldwide. And even today, whether they're meeting on Saturday or as in the Muslim world, they're meeting on Friday. Still, we're meeting all this weekend. We're thinking of Christ. We're thinking of what that means. We're singing a song. We appreciate the firm place we're standing on. And that makes us want to turn others back to him. That's how the message spreads. You're not alone. You think globally. You act locally. And doing that, we go from slime to the song, from the pit to passion, from mud to a mission, from being rescued to being rescuers. That is the thought. Please let it penetrate me.